Hi guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this video, I'm going to be covering neutropenia. Um, I'll be going into detail about that, but before we get started, guys, if you haven't done so already, please like this video, subscribe to this channel, uh, press that red notification button so you will be notified every time a new video is released. Don't forget, I have audio lessons available for you on my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. This is the book that I'm going to be teaching out of, guys. I teach out of several books. So there's no need to go and purchase a book every time I'm teaching out of a new one. Um, this video is being recorded, so you can just press pause. But for those that do want to purchase this book, you can go on Amazon and you'll find this book. This is the name of the book, author and edition, okay? So here we go. Let me make this bigger for you. Okay, so neutropenia. Um, neutro for neutrophils, Penia means a little bit of, so a little bit of neutrophils. Um, normal neutrophils should be around 2,500 to 7,000. Each book differs. The numbers uh, may vary slightly. However, the point is, guys, when a patient has neutropenia, they have just a little bit of neutrophils. That's a problem. Neutrophils, these are a type of what? WBC. What are WBCs important for? Fighting off infection. So any patient, any person that has neutropenia, they're going to be at risk for infection. So let's take a look, guys. It says neutrophenia, a neutrophil count of less than 2,000, results from decreased production of neutrophils or increased destruction of the cells. So two things can actually cause neutropenia. Either one, the body's not making enough of the neutrophils, and when I say body, let me be more specific, the bone marrow. Remember, guys, it's the bone marrow that makes your blood cells. It's the bone marrow that makes the different types of WBCs, RBC, platelets, right? So um, neutropenia can happen when that bone marrow is not making enough of the neutrophils. Or it can happen when maybe you had enough, you had enough neutrophils, but you have a condition that is destroying those neutrophils. Maybe you're taking a certain type of drug, or maybe you're on radiation. Other things can cause that. So those are the two things that most likely will cause a patient to have neutropenia. Neutrophils are essential in preventing and limiting bacterial infections. And that's why, again, guys, anyone who, whose neutrophil count is low, they're going to be at risk for infection. A patient with neutropenia is at increased risk for infection. Look at this. Look at what it says, guys. From both exogenous and endogenous sources. What does that mean? That means a patient with neutropenia, they can get an infection from an exogenous source. That means from an outside source, right? But they can also get it from an um, and endogenously, that means from inside, okay? So exogenously from an outside source, but they can get it from themselves, which means, I'm gonna give you a perfect example, guys. We carry staph on our skin all the time, but it doesn't harm us. That person with neutropenia, neutropenia, if they have a cut on their skin and that staph now gets inside of their bloodstream, that's a problem that can cause an infection. They're getting that infection from their own bodies. So this is what it means where it says the source can be exogenous from the outside or endogenous from within. Let's look at um, some causes. I'm not going to go over all of them. You guys can pause to read, but I'm going to go over the ones that appear most likely on test questions chemo and radiation. Remember guys, chemo, radiation. Yeah, they kill the bad cells, but they kill the good ones too. So these absolutely can cause patients to go through neutropenia. Absolutely. And let's look at what can cause increased destruction of the neutrophils. Um, medication induced, certain medications a patient takes. Um, immunological disorders such as lupus or viral disorders. So you guys can take a look at that. Look at this, the risk of infection. Wait, let me back up because I want to point something out to you. Let me, I'm going to back up a little bit. Let's go back to these two because I need to make sure that you guys understand chemo and radiation because I gave you half of it, really not all of it. So yes, chemo, radiation, they kill the bad cells, but they kill the good ones as well. Great. But guess what they also do? They cause bone marrow suppression. This is very important. Um, this has been shown on tests very often. So you guys have to understand this. 
if it causes bone marrow suppression. Why is that important to us? Well, I just told you the bone marrow is responsible for producing those RBCs, for producing those platelets, for producing those WBCs. So any patient that has bone marrow suppression, they're gonna be at risk for hemorrhaging because of the decreased platelets. They're gonna be at risk for anemia because of the decreased RBC. And they're gonna be at risk for infection because of the decreased WBC. Okay, because whenever a patient has bone marrow suppression, that bone marrow is not producing those blood cells the way that it should. All right, now we can move on. All right, the risk of infection increases proportionately with decrease of neutrophil count. Remember, neutrophils are fighter cells. They help fight infection. The risk of developing infection also increases with the length of time during which neutropenia persists even if it's somewhat mild. So even if the patient only has a mild case of neutropenia, their risk for infection increases every day that goes by that they have that mild case of neutropenia. That's the way it's saying. Signs and symptoms. There are no definite symptoms with neutropenia until that patient gets an infection. Once they get infection, we may see fever, we may see redness, we may see inflammation, right? But usually that patient doesn't even have any signs and symptoms of us knowing that um, they have neutropenia until they have an infection. Usually the way that we know they have neutropenia is actually running that CBC and looking at the blood count, okay? Look at what it says. There are no definite symptoms of neutropenia until the patient develops an infection. A routine CBC with differential because not only do we need to see the WBCs, we need to see the neutrophils and those other cells with differential as obtained after chemotherapy can reveal neutropenia before the onset of infection. So really that uh, WBC with the differential, that's what's really going to let us know if this patient has neutropenia so that we can put um, infection precautions in place for this patient. Quality and safety alert. Patients with neutropenia often do not exhibit classic signs and symptoms of infection. Fever is the most common indicator of infection, but even that's not always present, especially if the patient is taking corticosteroids. Why is that? Well, remember, guys, corticosteroids decrease inflammation. Corticosteroids mask those signs and symptoms of infection. So any patient that's taking corticosteroids, we have to monitor them much, much more closely because they mask the signs and symptoms of infection. So that patient might have an infection and we don't even know until it's too late. So we have to be watching that patient very, very closely. Medical management. Treatment of neutropenia uh, varies depending on the cause. If the neutropenia is medication induced, then obviously we're going to take them off that medication if it's possible. What else can we do? We can give them growth factors such as um, granulocyte colony stimulating factor or granulocyte macrophage stimulating factor. Those can be um, effective if the problem um, that's going on with this patient is that neutrophil production, okay? If the problem is them not producing enough of those neutrophils, we can give them growth factors. Let's look at this. Withholding or reducing the dose of chemo or radiation. Remember I told you, um, chemo and radiation are big factors in decreased production or even um, uh, those blood cells being destroyed, right? So withholding or reducing the dose of chemo or radiation may be required when neutropenia is caused by these treatments. Now, obviously, guys, we have to weigh the good versus the bad. The chemo or radiation, it may be causing that patient neutropenia, which means they're at risk for infection, but it may be also killing that tu tumor that may kill the patient. So, you know, it's like a balance game. If the neutropenia is accompanied by fever, the patient's considered to have an infection. And usually they're going to be admitted to the hospital. Why? Those patients with neutropenia, remember, most of the time, they don't even exhibit those signs and symptoms of infection. So we see a fever in a patient that has neutropenia. This is an acute situation. They need to be in the hospital. Cultures of blood, urine, sputum, as well as chest x-ray are going to be obtained to ensure adequate therapy against infectious organisms. Broad spectrum antibiotics are going to be initiated. 
Now, why are we giving broad spectrum? When something's broad spectrum, it kills everything. It kills the gram negative bacteria. It kills the gram positive bacteria. It kills everything. We don't wanna take any chances. Although the antibiotics may be changed after culture and sensitivity results are available, obviously when those results come back and we see the patients more sensitive to another type of antibiotics, we, as we expect um, that infectious disease healthcare provider to go ahead and change the type of antibiotic that the patient is on. Before I move on to nursing management, let's look at this chart. Risk factors, um, development of infection and bleeding in patients with hematologic disorders. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, bleeding is another subject within itself. I will be doing a video on that coming soon, but for right now, let's focus on the neutropenia, okay? So severity of neutropenia, risk of infection is proportional to the severity. So the lower that neutrophil number is, the higher that patient's risk is of having the infection. Duration of neutropenia, even if it's mild, guys, the longer that that patient has the neutropenia, the higher that patient's risk is of having the infection. Oh, now, guys, I'm not going to go over all of them. You have this, just press pause. You can read all of them. Poor hygiene. Guys, remember, I told you we carry staff on our skin. We can have bacteria on our skin, right? So a person who's neutropenic, we need them to have good hygiene. So what's on their skin doesn't get into their body and cause illness. All right. They need to have good hygiene down there. So they don't have bacteria growing down there and it creeps up into their body. They need to have good hygiene up here, brushing their teeth and flossing. So the food doesn't get stuck between your teeth, sit there, fester, bacteria grows, that bacteria goes from their mouth, creeps down their throat, and now they have infection in their body, right? So um, good hygiene is important. All right, let's move on. Nursing management. Take a look at this checklist. It's a home care checklist. Um, make sure you guys press pause to read all of this, but let's go and talk about... Um, the behaviors to prevent infection. What are you going to be teaching this patient? Maintain good hand hygiene. Number one, the number one way to prevent transmission of infection is always going to be hand hygiene. Teach them good hand hygiene technique, total body technique from your head to your toe and skin integrity. Let's keep that skin intact so no bacteria, pathogens, or microorganisms can get into body. Look at this. Avoid cleaning bird cages and litter boxes in parentheses because they didn't put in the book. I couldn't find it, but I'm going to tell you why because NCLEX expects you to know why. Toxoplasmosis. Any patient that is um, immunocompromised has neutropenia. An HIV patient, a patient that's getting chemo, radiation, anything that puts that patient at risk for infection, they cannot be cleaning bird cages, cat litter box because of the risk of them getting toxoplasmosis. Consider avoiding garden work such as soil, fresh flowers in stagnant water. You're going to teach them to maintain a high calorie, high protein diet with lots of fluids, 3000 mLs per day. Let's break that down. High calorie. What do calories do? Give us energy. Why would this type of patient need energy? To fight off the infection. High protein diet. What's protein good for? Cell regeneration, wound healing. So yes, that patient is going to need high protein diet. And of course, lots of fluids. And when the book says lots of fluids, guys. Fluids is not talking about orange soda or Pepsi or Coke, okay? Fluids is not even talking about juice. Fluids is talking about H2O, water, okay? Flush your system, flush those kidneys, okay? Drink lots of water. Avoid people with infections in crowds. That patient that's immunocompromised, they should not have visitors that are sick. They should not have vis visitors with upper respiratory infections. That, that They should not be going to concerts where there are large crowds because there's a high chance that they'll be around somebody else that's sick. Remember, this person's immunocompromised. Perform deep breathing and use incentive spirometry. Why? Deep breathing, you're expanding your lungs. You're exercising those lungs. Incentive spirometry does the same thing. Why is that important? It prevents infection such as what? Pneumonia. Okay. Provide um, adequate lubrication with gentle 
Vaginal manipulation during sexual intercourse. Avoid anal intercourse. Why? Because of this, I wrote in parentheses, skin integrity. If the vagina is not adequately lubricated, when they're having intercourse, it could cause a vaginal tear. And remember, the patient has to maintain skin integrity because that pa those pathogens, those microorganisms, is very easily to get into the circulatory system. And before you know it, that patient has sepsis. Okay, so those are very important things to teach to that patient with neutropenia. And guys, that is your neutropenia in a nutshell. Um, I highlighted, underlined, and put a star next to the ones that you're most likely to see on the test. But I don't write your exam, so make sure that you completely read everything that I just went over in this video. Please, guys, give me your feedback. Let me know what you thought about this video. Let me know what you'd like to see on the next video. Please, to support my channel, share my content, guys. The more that my channel grows, that's the more... Um, the more, what's the word I'm looking for? I don't remember the name, but you know, the people that advertise on the website. So that's more support for my channel, which will allow me that time to do what? Make more videos for you. So please share my videos on your social media with a friend, coworker, with your instructor. Don't forget to like, subscribe, press that red notification button. And don't forget, you guys can catch me on TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook, plus my audio lessons available for you on my website. Thank you so much for watching this video. And you guys are see me on the next video.